creative power. Chapter 8, The Art of Creation. Passing on from the consideration of the more familiar forms of the application of efficient constructive imagination, you are now asked to enter into a consideration of a still higher phase of that creative power, which is a mode of manifestation of your personal power. Your personal power, in turn, is but a phase of the all power that is power, in which you live and move and have your being, and which is all that all which is in all things and in which all things are. You are now asked to consider the subject of your creative power in its higher phases of manifestation. Creation is an attribute of the highest power of which you can have any knowledge of or which you may dream. Whatever else the supreme power may be or may not be, it must be conceived as creative power. The fact that the power behind creation must be creative and the fact that creation must be the result of power must bring to the mind of the true thinker the conviction that in creative power is to be found power in its most essential and elemental aspect. In creation, you participate with the supreme power. To create is to bring into being, to cause, to produce. Man may be said, apparently, to create in several ways, yet at the last, he is found to be able to create in only one essential way, and that one essential way in which he can create is found to be the way in which the ultimate creative power proceeds in its own creative work. It will be well for you to become convinced of the essential and elemental nature of your own creative power in order that you may realize the majesty and dignity of the forces and energies which you call into play and operation in your own creative activities. First of all, you can create material objects by means of combining other material objects. Thus, you bring into being houses, boats, railroads, shoes, and every other class of things which are manufactured or made from material things. Secondly, you can create material things by changing the arrangement of the constituent parts of other material things, as for instance, you create butter by means of churning cream, or you can create ice by freezing water. Thirdly, you can create things by analysis or separation of the parts of other things. For instance, you create certain chemical substances by separating them from more complex substances of which they have formed a part. Or you create a statue by cutting away the surrounding marble from about the form of the created thing. The above classification will be found roughly to include practically all the forms and phases of creation with which you are most familiar, but we have omitted from it the most essential element. That element which constitutes the spirit of all your creative work, namely the element of mental creation. At the last, all of the above mentioned forms of creation are discovered to be merely the objectification or of the subjective mental creation. In the three forms of creation above mentioned, you have merely employed the materials at hand and formed new combinations with them. You brought none of these original materials into being. You merely found them in being and gave new objective forms to them. But how did you arrive at a knowledge of those forms which you afterward objectified? Here we come to the heart of the subject. The answer is the forms of your creations, each, any and all of them existed in your mind before you objectified them. Your creations then at the last are seen to be mental creations in the sense that they were mentally designed and deliberately caused by you. Of course, if you merely threw the materials together without any design, then you cannot be said to have mentally created the new thing. In that case, the latter was created not by you, but by the forces of nature. This also would be the case in the event that you discovered a chemical process by accident and without design, or where you unwittingly set into operation some of, some of nature's forces and thereby called into appearance certain new forms, arrangements, separations, or combinations. But whatever and whenever you have deliberately employed your creative power toward definite ends, then 
your first step and stage has been that of mental creation. Everything that man has ever created, contrived, built, invented, or manufactured has first been created in his mind as a mental image. The Brooklyn Bridge, the Eiffel Tower, the pyramids, and also the simplest mechanical construction, each and all existed in the minds of their inventors, architects, and builders before they took on objective form. There can be no such thing as constructive or creative work by man without the antecedent mental creation by means of mental images. Therefore, in its essential and elemental nature, all human creation is mental creation. Philosophers have carried this idea up to the realm of metaphysics and have asserted that we are compelled to think of the supreme creative power as having first formed the mental image of the universe before the form of the physical world could have come into being. More than this, they hold that the actual creation of the materials of the universe must have been mental because the material substance could not have been present until it was called into being by the mental forces that at the last, the material world is but a materialization of previously existing mental images or forms and that the very work of the materialization was performed by mental powers and energies, for there were no material powers present and existent in the beginning. Edward Carpenter illustrates this idea in the following statement contained in one of his books. Quote, there is now a disposition to posit the mental world as nearer the basis of existence than is the material world, and to look upon material phenomena rather as the outcome of expression of the mental. In observing our own thoughts and actions and bodily forms coming into existence, we seem to come upon something which we may call a law of nature, just as much as gravitation or any other law. The law, namely, that within ourselves, there is a continued movement outwards from feeling toward thought and then to action from the inner to the outer, from the vague to the definite, from the emotional to the practical, from the world of dreams to the world of actual things and what we call reality. We may fairly conclude that the same progress may be witnessed both in our waking thoughts and in our dreams, namely a continual evolution and birth going on within us and an evolution out of the mind stuff of forms, which are the expression and images of underlying feeling, that these forms at first vague and undetermined in outline rapidly gather definition and clearness and materiality and press forward toward expression in the outer world. And we may fairly ask whether we are not here within our own minds witnessing what is really taking place everywhere and at all times in other persons as well as in ourselves, and in the great life which underlies and is the visible universe. You may say that there is no evidence that man ever produces a particle of matter out of himself, and I will admit that this is so, but there is plenty of evidence that he produces shapes and forms, and if he produces shapes and forms, that is all we need. For what matter is in the abstract no one has been has the least experience and knowledge. All that we know is that the things we see are shapes and forms of what we call matter. And if, as is possible and indeed probable, matter is of the same stuff as mind, only seen and envisioned from the opposite side, then the shapes and forms of the actual world are the shapes and forms of mind, thus projected for us mutually to witness and to understand. But we do not need to fall back upon metaphysical speculations in order to support our general contention that there is mental image back of every phase and form of physical creation. Throughout all nature, we may find striking instances and illustrations of the general principles that there is an idea or mental image or form present in all of nature's creative processes from the formation of a crystal to the development of the forms of living creatures. The formation of a crystal, the development of the plant or tree from the seed, the evolution of the living form from the egg cells, 
All of these reveal to us the fact that idea or mental form is eminent and involved in every process of birth and growth in nature. This being perceived, we are justified in claiming that all creation is mental creation, the materialization of a mental form, image, or idea. Throughout all nature, we may perceive the presence of an inner image or form which serves as the framework or pattern upon which nature materializes her objective forms. These ideal forms have attracted the attention of the philosophers and they have sought to account for their presence. From the time of Plato down to the present, philosophers have speculated concerning the nature and evident presence of these ideal forms upon which nature builds her material shapes and structures. In the above quotation from Carpenter, you will note the reference to the evolution out of mind stuff of forms which are the expressions and images of underlying feeling. These forms at first vague and undetermined in outline rapidly gather definition and clearness and materiality and press forward toward expression in the outer world. Paul Karos, a modern philosopher, also says, all science consists in describing forms and tracing their changes. All differences that we can scientifically comprehend are the forms of matter or energy. All that we can do or try to do is by molding and remolding things. Forms are the types of possible entities and do not exist as such in the shape of material realities, but we cannot say that they are non-existent nor that they are not. They are maybes or potentialities and according to the law of their combination, the things of the material world are molded. They are the factors which determine material reality. And in this sense, pure forms are more important than our material and actual things. They are super real and their super reality contains the norms of all existence. Pure form looks like non-entity and yet the laws of pure form are the factors that determine existence in all of its details. Pure form conditions the cosmic order and governs the universe. The pure form of the philosophers is undoubtedly immaterial in its nature. It clearly must be mental form. In other words, nature is seen to proceed just as does man in his work of creation. She builds the material universe upon mental patterns or upon mental frameworks. Just how or why this is so, the human mind is unable to grasp. But all investigation reveals the fact that the creative processes proceed in just this way. In this correspondence between human creative activity and that of the cosmos, we have a striking illustration of the principle embodied in the ancient hermetic axiom. As above, so below, as within, so without. The macrocosm and the microcosm evidently work under the same laws and manifest according to the same general principles. Beginning with the particles of which the atoms are composed and with the atoms of which all forms of matter are composed, we see the creation of material forms apparently proceeding in accordance with some pre-existing pattern, ideal form, type, or idea. Atoms group themselves in certain combinations, forming certain elements of matter, all of which forms are true to general types and are as nearly identical as the bits of metal which are cut out of the same dye or else produced from the same mold. This uniformity and adherence to type certainly is explainable only upon the hypothesis that before the material form is produced, there must exist some pattern, type, idea, or mental form which governs the materialization. There is no hit or miss or higgly-piggly arrangement of the atoms. They group themselves according to typical forms, and these forms must exist ideally before the material form can be produced. That which we call the inner nature of anything is really a combination of certain inherent mental forms which are constantly striving to express themselves in action and objective appearance. The inner nature of the atom is clearly represented in and by its activities. The inner nature of the animal is likewise so represented by its action and its physical form. 
The voluntary self-moved spontaneous actions of any particular thing clearly represent the inner nature of that particular thing. The differences between classes of things result from the difference in the inner natures and the inner natures are merely the ideal forms or types, the mental images, which constitute the elemental and essential basis of the character of those things. The operation and manifestation of these inner natures or creative ideal forms has a striking illustri illustration in the case of the crystallization of the minerals or chemical elements. These crystals are formed in the mother liquor according to well-known and clearly defined shape, form, and order. Each species of crystal has its own particular form and arrangement. Some have a range of several of such forms, each however being true to type and pattern. Each species of crystal obeys its own order and rule concerning its form. Crystals grow just as do plants according to a certain pattern and type form. These forms and orders of arrangement are not caused by outside forces or energies. They result from the in forces of the mineral or chemical substance from the operation of internal inherent energy and in response to some inner idea, form or pattern, which constitutes the inner nature of the mineral or chemical compound. In the same way, we find that in the material form of the germ of this acorn, there dwells an inner nature composed of these ideal forms or mental images, these inner patterns. These inner forces determine the material form which the sprout, root, leaves, and her complete tree shall assume. The deviations from the ideal forms result from the influence of external forces serving to modify and deflect, to cramp and to hinder the expression of the inner form, but the inner pattern is always there doing the best it can to represent itself truly in material appearance. In every acorn, there abides the design, pattern, form, and idea of the future oak. And the acorn never evolves and unfolds anything not according to that pattern, design, or idea. In the same way, the seed or germ of every plant, animal, or human being contains within itself its inner nature composed of ideal form and pattern, type, or mold. It is this inner nature or ideal form that causes the acorn to develop into the oak instead of into the pine tree. It causes the egg of the chicken to develop into a chick and not into a baby hawk. It causes the creature to develop from seed germ into completed adult form, always true to type and ideal pattern. Scientists who have witnessed the unfoldment of living forms from the reproductive cells or egg body have testified in glowing words of wonder and admiration to the evident presence of something like a directive mind at work in the processes underway in the tiny speck of protoplasm, which we call the reproductive cell or egg of the animal. Huxley, describing the development of the tiny egg of a newt, which is a small aquatic salamander, uh, he said, the plastic matter undergoes changes so rapid and so purpose-like in their succession that one can only compare them to those operated by a skilled modeler upon a formless lump of clay. As with an invisible trowel, the mass is divided and subdivided. Then it is if a delicate finger traced out the lines to be occupied by the spinal column and molded the contour of the body, pinching up the head of one and the tail at the other and fashioning flank and limb into due salamandering proportions in so artistic a way that after watching the process hour by hour, one is almost involuntary possessed by the notion that some more subtle aid to the vision than the achromatic lens would show the hidden artist with his plan before him, striving with skillful manipulation to perfect his work. The same great scientist speaking of the continued life of the newt says, as life advances and the young amphibian ranges the waters, the terror of his insect contemporaries, not only the nutritious particles supplied by its prey, by the addition of which to its frame growth takes place, 
are laid down each in its proper spot and in due proportion to the rest, so as to reproduce the, the parent stock. But even the wonderful powers of reproducing lost parts, which are possessed by these animals, are controlled by the same governing tendency. Cut off the legs, the tail, the jaws, separately or all together, and these parts not only grow again, but the new limb is formed on the same type as those which were lost. The new jaw or leg is a newt, and never by accident, more like that of a frog. In the above graphic word picture of Huxley, we catch a glimpse of the subtle, silent manifestations of this materialization of mental images in nature. For the same kind of processes are underway in all sides of us, on all planes of nature's activities, and in all of her phases of life processes. There is constantly underway a process of growth, production, reproduction, building, repairing, replacing, and general creative construction. And in each and all such forms and phases, we may see the presence of a given pattern, form, type, or mold, an ideal design or scheme upon which the materialization is effected. The governing tendency referred to by Huxley is seen to be none other than the operation of that principle of creative mental form upon which all materialization depends. Moreover, we may see the operation of the same principle in the direction of the variation of form, faculty and function in the life forms. Indeed, this principle constitutes the directing force of evolution. Lamarck and other scientists have shown us that evolution proceeds not only by natural selection, but also by the unfoldment of ideal forms or mental images. Thus, the new needs and requirements of the evolving life forms are first manifested as ideal forms or mental images, patterns, molds, or types in the subconscious mentality of the creature. These then, moving toward representation, expression, and manifestation on the objective material plane. Thus, the inner nature, gradually becomes modified by environment and the outer form gradually responds to these changes. Illustrating this principle, we call your attention to the fact that certain schools of scientific thought hold that the long legs and long neck of the giraffe were evolved in response to the creative idea working through many generations of its ancestors. The ancestors found it difficult to reach the tender, juicy branches of certain trees, which were needed as food. This need and this difficulty were recognized by the subconscious mentality of the animal, and the creative idea began to shape and fashion the ideal form or mental image of the long legs and long neck, which afterwards manifested in physical form in the descendants of the animal. In the same way, were evolved and perfected the long legs and long bills of the wading fish catching birds. Again, thus were evolved the cruel beaks and talons of the hawks, eagles, and other carnivorous prey capturing birds, and the claws and fangs of the carnivorous animals. In short, many thoughtful scientists recognize the existence and activity in nature of a principle which tends to manifest an objective material form that which has previously existed as a mental form or ideal image in the subconscious mentality of living creatures. The mental form or ideal image having arisen in response to a strong need, want, lack or desire of the creature as in the illustrative cases above cited. The advanced guard of the new psychology carries this principle to its logical conclusion when it asserts that the human being is able to set into operation great natural forces tending to produce similar objective results when he deliberately creates strong ideals and then passes the same down to his subconscious mentality. Here is a hint at a mighty principle. Many persons are disposed to regard as more or less unreal and unsubstantial anything that is purely ideal and mental in its nature. To such we would cite the celebrated rule of Spinoza. A thing has only so much reality as it possesses power. 
Applying this rule to the ideal forms or mental images underlying material forms, you will discover that such possess a very high degree of reality and substantiality. Ideal forms and creative mental images are not merely such stuff as dreams are made of, but in reality are strong, powerful forces. In fact, many manifestations of natural forces are really efforts toward the expression of the creative idea. The inner form striving to manifest in the outer form often exercises a tremendous force. The inner form of a cracking plant has been known to crack a heavy concrete block and the power of growing roots arising from the inner urge of the ideal form has been known to tear asunder heavy foundation stones. John Burroughs, the great naturalist, says concerning this force of this inner form striving for outward expression, we know that the roots of trees insert themselves into seams in the rocks and force the rocks asunder. This force is immeasurable and often is very great. Its seat seems to be in the soft milky substance called the cambium layer under the bark. These minute cells, when their force is combined, may become regular rock splitters. One of the most remarkable exhibitions of plant force I ever saw was in a Western city where I observed a species of wild sunflower forcing its way up through the asphalt pavement. The folded and compressed leaves of the plant, like a man's fist, had pushed against the hard but flexible concrete until it had bulged up and then split and let the irrepressible plant through. The force exerted must have been many pounds. I think it's doubtful if the strongest man could have pushed his fist through such a resisting medium. If it was not life which exerted this force, then what was it? In the same way, the great giants of the forest have pushed their way up toward the skies, counteracting the pull of gravitation and lifting weights, which it would have required mighty machinery to move. The mental pattern in the giant redwood forest proceeds to the materialization of the gigantic outer form of the tree and the inner urge of the ideal form calls to its aid the mighty latent forces of nature in order to materialize that which is contained in the ideal form or mental image of the living organism of the tree. Nature seems ready to furnish such power to the inner urge provided that such is sufficiently needed insistently desired and persistently demanded and provided that it is called for in the right way. So if man ever obtains the inner secret of this demand, he will have the creative powers and forces of nature in his hands. Already he has acquired a portion of this secret and is able to perform mighty creative work by directing his mental powers toward the physical plane. In this instruction, we seek to disclose the principles of this process to you. The attention of certain philosophers has been attracted by this manifestation in nature's activities of the process closely resembling constructive imagination. They venture the hypothesis that the creative powers and processes of the human mind have an equivalent in nature's processes of growth in living forms, vegetable and animal. A little known though worthy metaphysician has gone so far as to elevate to the rank of the ultimate world principle, that which we know as the constructive imagination. He asserts that there is a cosmic constructive imagination working in nature, producing the myriad forms and varieties of vegetable and animal forms. He holds further that the same principle in the form of the human constructive imagination enables man to become a creator on his own plane of life. This metaphysician holds that constructive imagination is the essential characteristic attribute of the ultimate principle of the cosmos. He holds that this essential attribute is inherent in the very essence of all things and in the world as a whole. He postulates its existence in the all things as an eminent principle just as in the kernel of the plant seed, there exists an eminent principle which will give to the evolving plant its form and its type of organism. This cosmic principle, he asserts, 
has manifested the myriads of vegetable and animal forms which have existed or now exist and will so manifest those forms which shall in the future exist in the world. He holds that the first creations were quite simple, but that little by little, the cosmic constructive imagination increased its energy and manifested in a more complex forms. He cites Darwin as testimony that in nature, there has been a slow evolution of organized forms proceeding from the simple to the more complex and so on. We are not here concerned with philosophical hypotheses nor with metaphysical speculations. But at the same time, we feel it is proper to direct your attention to the fact that there is manifest in all nature, the operation of a powerful principle which proceeds from the inner form to the outer manifestation, from the ideal image to its materialization in objective form. We have given you in the foregoing pages, certain typical illustrations of the operation of this natural principle or process. By looking around you at the world of living and growing things, you will be able to perceive countless instances of the operation of the same power once your attention has been called to it. Likewise, we wish to call to your attention the fact that many earnest thinkers hold that that which is called the constructive imagination in the mind of man is but a special form of the great natural principle. And that man himself like nature as a whole has within himself the power of creation by means of the materialization of his ideal forms. Your experience has taught you that the men who have accomplished the great creative achievements in art, literature, mechanics, invention, building, and business construction have created the outer manifestation in accordance with the inner ideal or mental picture, the latter serving as the model, type, mold, or pattern of the former. But the principle operates over a much wider area and extends to a much deeper level of being than you have realized. It is a fact acknowledged by many very careful observers and reasoners that the man of strong ideals, he whose mind contains strong, clear mental pictures of that which he hopes to accomplish, actually sets into operation the forces, powers, and energies of his entire mental and physical being. These in turn draw upon the common source of nature for their nourishment and subsistence. And all the power so generated tends toward manifestation and expression in the material form, which is being built upon the mental framework or pattern of the creative idea. Just as the oak is able to draw upon nature for power, with which it may lift itself far above the surface of the earth and to send forth mighty limbs and branches, just as the growing plant is able to secure from nature sufficient force to enable it to push aside or break through the obstacles in the path of its progress, even through concrete blocks, as we have seen, so may the creative idea of the man who knows be able to draw upon nature for the still more subtle forces of her laboratory needed to materialize his ideal forms, to make his ideals become real. Not only this, but there is a rapidly growing body of human thinkers who hold that man in such cases is not necessarily limited to the mechanism of his own organism in the expression of his inner urge by means of the forces which he has attracted to him. They hold that he even may and often really does throw out mental or spiritual filaments which contact the things of the outside world, thereby attracting to himself the external forces and things requisite for the successful materialization of his inner ideal, his mental forms, his creative idea. In this book, we have sought to present to you the essential principles of this great subject of creative power, of the materialization and actualization of your creative ideas. In doing so, however, we first asked you to become far better acquainted with an existing field of mental activity, which you have previously undervalued and grossly misunderstood, your power of constructive imagination. This mental stone, heretofore rejected by the builders of the temple of mental power, is now being recognized by advanced thinkers as quite worthy of being given the place of honor as the cornerstone of the great structure. 
We are fast approaching the place in which we shall see the inner meaning of the ancient philosophers who asserted that in will and imagination, combined and harmonized, are to be found the secret of power.